ladies and gentlemen welcome to the q4 fy22 results conference call of arman financial services hosted by mk global financial services we have with us today mr jayendra patel vice chairman and managing director mr alok patel joint managing director and mr vivek modi group chief financial officer as a reminder all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of today's presentation should you need assistance during the conference please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touch tone phone please note that this conference is being recorded i would now like to hand over the conference to Mr Manjeet from MK Global Financial Services thank you and over to you Mr Manjeet Hi this is Manjeet here uh, good evening everyone i would like to welcome the management team of Arman Financial and uh, thank them for this opportunity i shall now hand over the call to the management for opening remarks sorry over over to you sir thank you thank you manjeet uh, and uh, good evening to everybody uh, this is alok patel here and it's uh, as always it's a pleasure to connect with all of you again and thanks for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us uh, over this call and to discuss our financial performance for the quarter and the year ended march 22 we have issued a detailed press release and investor presentation for the quarter and i hope you've had a chance to review it The presentation was uploaded with a minor delay today morning so my sincerest apologies for the delay. I will start with a brief overview of the industry and the business during the last quarter and last year and then we will move into our financial performance. The year gone by had its fair share of challenges starting with the second wave of COVID-19 with the delta variant during the first quarter and then the third wave with the omicron variant in the third or the fourth quarter however with several covid waves and lockdowns in the past few years we have managed the third wave with very minimal disruptions the second wave however proved to be highly disruptive as i'm sure all of you are aware that said the situation is a lot different today for now it seems that covid is behind us and things are back to normal with the normalization of the macro environment the demand for credit is also back to normal however if another wave is hiding around the corner we feel a lot more confident in our ability to deal with it in fact the disbursements made post the initial lockdowns have a repayment rate of 98% despite facing the second wave and the third wave with the new RBI regulatory framework for microfinance loans the NBFC MFIs will have a level playing field with other microfinance players and also allow us to price in risk for different microfinance loans although the new regulation is targeted more towards bringing different categories of lenders that is banks NBFCs SFDs etc under one regulatory umbrella it seems that the nbfc mfi stand to give our financial performance for the fourth fourth quarter and the year ended march 22 and post that that's upon liquidity disbursements and collections in more detail coming to the brief overview of our financial performance for the quarter it gives me immense pleasure to inform you all that despite the challenges of our consolidated loan book as on 31st march 2022 uh, excuse me uh, our consolidated loan book as on 31st march 2022 stood at a record high of 1233 crores led by expansion in branch network which helped cater into new customers in geographies along with pent up demand from existing geographies our active customer base this year has crossed pre covid levels at over 4.6 lakh segmental aum for microfinance stood at 1022 crores higher by 59% year over year and aum for msme stood at 165 crores higher by 32% for the two wheeler segment our aum stood at 46 crores 
consolidated loan disbursements during Q4 and FY22 stood at 337 crores and 1023 crores respectively, up by 23% and 101% year over year. The total MSME and two-wheeler disbursements in Q4 and FY22 were 58 crores and 183 crores respectively, higher by 7% over year. Excuse me. Uh, While well, microfinance, uh, excuse me, I'm going to start again. I was just got distracted. Uh, While well, microfinance disbursements stood at 279 crores for Q4 and 840 crores for FY22, higher by 22% and 101% year over year, respectively. This encouraging performance was as a result of our consistent endeavor to remain in close touch with our customers and provide them with timely delivery of credit. I would like to highlight here that while we grew our disbursements in AUM, our core focus will always remain and always lie on maintaining the quality of our assets and on enhancing profitability. Gross total income during Q4 and FY22 stood at 67 crores and 235 crores respectively, up by 68% and 20% year over year. Profit after tax stood at 16 crores and 32 crores for Q4 and FY22 respectively. FY22 PAT grew by 3x year over year, aided by growth in disbursements and specially lower provisioning requirements due to better asset quality of the loans dispersed post COVID-19. These are loans dispersed post August 2020. The annualized ROE for the fourth quarter has also crossed 30%. Consolidated GNPS stood at 4.1% and NNPS stood at 0.7% for 31st March 2022. The company, has steadily, the company has steadily created adequate provisions to take care of the unprecedented impact of the COVID pandemic. Loan impairment cost for the quarter stands at 10.8 crores. Cumulative total provisions and write-offs for the year was 37 crores as on 31st March 2022. The total provisions on the books stood at 65 crores as on March 31st, 2022 covering 5.73% of the total on-book AUM. The company enjoys a healthy liquidity position with 150 crores in cash, bank balance, liquid investments, and undrawn CC limits, aided by pickup in collections along with incremental debt capital raised. The company has, of course, duly repaid all debt obligations that were due in Q4 22 and last year, with debt equity ratio of 4.65x on 31st March 22, and while shareholders' equity stood at approximately 213 crores. ALM continues to remain positive, and the company continues to have access to new sources of funds due to the company's robust balance sheet, long vintage, and prudent lending practices. Coming to collections, our consolidated collection efficiency saw further improving trends during the quarter and grew from 92% in Q3 FY22 to 95% in Q4 FY22. Collection efficiency for the month of April crossed more than 98%. Robust collection efficiencies were a result of passionate on-ground workforce, continuous customer interactions, and the customer-focused approach. We have successfully completed our branch expansion plans and added 30 new branches in the MFI and MSME segment. Our total branch network as on 31st March 22 stands at 292 branches. The expansion has not only given us deeper penetration by tapping into newer districts in existing states, but also given us an opportunity to explore new geographies. Due to our asset-like business model, the capex spent on branch expansion was fairly minimal, allowing us to reach branch level break-even quite quickly. Finally, to conclude, I would like to say that our company remains dedicated to serving the most underserved and unserved population of India. Our endeavor is to make them part of India's growth story by making them financially independent. 
today india has a massive growth potential in the micro finance lending landscape financial inclusion remains a key goal of government of india with the new rbi guidelines the outlook for the sector remains very much positive i'll also conclude by saying that in september of this year arman will be celebrating its 30th year in operations we have seen a lot of ups and a few downs as well none of it would have been as enjoyable or meaningful without the relationships you have built along the way with our employees customers lenders investors the board our peers and all the other stakeholders so big thank you from our side for your constant support thank you and i would now request michel the operator to call uh, to open up the call for the question and answer session thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touch tone phone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and two participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles The first question is from the line of Amit Mantri from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Alok. Amit here. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So, just a first couple of questions on uh, this quarter's results. So, uh, the yield has increased a lot this quarter, and even the provisions are uh, uh, fairly uh, continue to be elevated. So, uh, what is the reason for both of these things? the yields have increased because uh, uh, for number amit uh, the yields have in particular gone up because we've done a portfolio transaction a securitization transaction of 100 crores being offloaded to uh, state bank of india and uh, under the india's uh, requirement uh, the gain uh, on uh, transaction on such transaction needs to be booked up front so there is a Uh, gain of 5.8 crores uh, on on this transaction uh, in this quarter, and especially in Namra's balance sheet, uh, in Namra's P&L, which obviously flows into the consolidated. Well. But even if I exclude this 5.6, yeah, so that's one. And uh, overall, uh, uh, you know, in the quarter three, when we talk of, if we were to kind of compare quarter three. quarter 3 if you remember uh, was a quarter wherein uh, the uh, fresh uh, disbursement had to take place at a lower yield because of the cgs uh, uh, corporate uh, or rather the central government guarantee scheme in microfinance so those were at a lower yield of 2% at that point of time so on a comparative basis uh, from q3 to q4 uh, the delta would be slightly Yeah, just slightly it's like due to timing differences and due to an overall increase also in the yields in the last quarter and then um, uh, maybe i can just also add uh, a bit on the two wheeler side where and again the yield has been moving up uh, primarily what is happening is about 30% of the books are now rural two wheelers where and our yields have been higher and as as that component keeps on increasing the property side provision side that we you know i think we are pretty much done uh, i think overall uh, we had i think i keep saying this uh, in, on the arman side i don't think the provisions were very very high on the number side uh, we were doing a lo- lot of clean up kind of an exercise uh, can you hear me hello hello am i clear audible am i audible yes okay so yeah i, I think the provisions were just a uh, lot of the clean up exercises and the write offs that we were doing on it uh, and it is what it is yeah i mean and besides so, that i don't know so generally generally uh, amit what has also happened in uh, in arman is to see the overall provisioning requirement for the last couple of quarters anyway has been very fairly stable or rather on the decline in number uh, 
because of the basic uh, uh, completely unsecured quality of the book, we uh, kept on providing as far as possible and required. And at a console level, since we continue to have about 5% provisioning uh, on the uh, overall EUM, I think we have largely, if we can say, we are well provisioned and uh, Hopefully, I mean, I hate to say this because every time we say this, something goes wrong, maybe. But largely, it feels that we've seen a few of the worst quarters that COVID yeah. had to show us. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of this uh, you are seeing is related to, uh, you know, the, the second wave specifically. Not so much the third one, but the second wave. Thank you. Mr. Amit? I think we can continue. It might have dropped. Yes, probably. Uh, reminder to all the participants, please press star and one on your touchstone phone to ask any question. The next question is from the line of Savi from Point to Point Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, Savi. Yeah. Yeah, I think Amit dropped out. Uh, uh, so I have a couple of questions. One is on the, I think there's some laws that you've taken through the other comprehensive income. What is that? Uh, 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 you know, sorry, uh, on, on uh, the India side, since uh, you need to kind of uh, market to the market, the portfolio, and uh, the under the new uh, rate of interest that we're charging in the future, the overall interest rate, average interest rates have gone up, and based on that, uh, the OCI will turn out to be... Uh, you know, a notional loss, if we can put it that way. It's it's more like an India's adjustment. But this must be a loss on your uh, bond portfolio, but I presume that will be low duration. So for, uh, this is not a bond portfolio. Bond portfolio. This is for the entire portfolio that the entire portfolio under the NDAS. Uh, this will be a liquid fund, right? This no. is not related to liquid funds. It's a little bit complicated to explain. It has nothing reality, if I want to put it that way. Basically, the market rates have moved up, and the portfolio that we have created in the past has a lower interest yield. So, India requires to take a notional loss through OCI, OCI, but it has nothing to do with the cash flows or anything like that. So, this will reverse over time. Is it expected to reverse? Uh, yes, it will automatically reverse. Let's say if uh, if, if uh, you know the interest cycles kind of come down. Uh, sorry, uh, fundamentally, why this happens is that microfinance and MSME and even two wheelers. So all our three segments, the lending is done at a fixed rate. Uh, you know, it's not a flexi rate which adjusts. Hence. Uh, if the if the interest rates were to uh, rise, we will have a notional loss, and if the cycle reverses, then we might have a notional profit. Okay. And, uh, over a period of time, either uh, as as we keep on building the book, our average uh, yield might increase, and hence the loss uh, will become uh, the the notional loss will become small, you know a bit smaller. Or uh, if there is an interest rate cycle reversal in a couple of quarters, then oh, then again it might lead to a notional gain. Got it. Yeah. Even I don't completely completely understand <laughs> it myself. Uh, <laughs> okay. On the uh, net NPA uh, you know number, uh, have you knocked off all the provisions, including floating provisions, while calculating that number? Uh, when you say floating, that no. What do you try to mean on that? Like this is net of all kinds of provisions that you have 
taken till date is it is this number net of all or only net of the specific provisions uh, no net of all the provisions because if i if my gross npas are uh, let's say 100 rupees as against that if sorry the, to interrupt uh, mrs savi uh, yeah. you you ha you'll have to join the queue again please there are participants we'll, finish, we'll, we'll, finish, we'll answer we'll finish answering this question okay sir uh, thank you so much the, yeah uh so so uh, you know uh, eventually uh, this covers uh, to, uh, i mean to cut the answer short uh, this includes uh, the total provisions against e specific specific loan account sorry this includes all the provisions including the floating provisions specifically associated to that particular account all the np accounts okay so so there is no i mean there is no additional separate npa floating provision apart from uh, what has been already uh, deducted from the gross npa to arrive the net npa okay okay i'll ask yeah. i'll be on the quick queue for the for the question yeah. thank you anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one the next question is from the line of piyush jain from hansraj virendra capital please go ahead hello sir many congratulations for good set of numbers so can you just throw some highlight on the new geographies where you are expanding and second question would be in the new geographies how do you see the market with respect to the home state or i would say the gujarat market means with respect to either the loan dispersal or the collection is there any process improvement or after seeing the market are we doing something different to perform better over there or let's say what's the performance over there if you can throw some light no i, I think mean, uh, so i think we expanded into haryana uh, late right. end of last year early this year so we have about 15 branches there and we have opened up around uh, 12 odd branches i believe in bihar so these are new geographies for us uh, both of them as far as uh, performance as far as npas go they are practically zero at this point uh, but that that is not a typical when you have to move into a new area because you know you start very very cautiously to begin with and you have a lot of management bandwidth there to begin with uh, both of them are slightly different areas so aryana uh, the scope is probably just to open 15 odd branches so being a smaller state and with areas uh, relatively being richer if i can use that term uh, the 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 growth the, there is no potential for a very rapid growth in haryana but it's still a extremely good area to operate into uh, as far as our experience is concerned so far uh, bihar on the other hand is a high, very concentrated area but if data proves anything it is one of the best areas in india to operate considering that if you look at demonetization data and you look at the past covid data uh, one of the best performances has come out of bihar as far as the repayment uh, but that being said it is a bit crowded and uh, you know if we were going to expand into bihar uh, it is better to do it sooner rather than later to gain market share so far i mean we are not uh, i mean it's the disbursement volumes are average but it's little early to tell so uh, i would say we'd have to give it at least another 6 months to a year to kind of uh, give you a real kind of a feedback on how that state is turning out to be uh and uh, you know if i have if i can i think your other question was how does it compare to my state well you know every state is a little different and you have to approach it little differently uh but the good part about microfinance is that it's replicable across state lines as well so you don't have to begin from scratch you know 90% of what you do in gujarat is the same as what you do in bihar or any other place uh the 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 trickiest part is managing the people uh, otherwise the business is so operationally it's quite intense uh 
but uh, you know, from an understanding perspective, it's not a very very difficult. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, sir. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. May you press star and one to ask a question on your touch tone phone. The next question is from the line of Kune Gilani from Vivriti AMC. Please go ahead. Hi, Abhav. Hi, Vivek. Good evening to you guys. Uh, Good evening. I wanted to understand uh, how is it that you're going about uh, you know, reacting to the changes that are coming uh, from RBI on... Uh, Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Kune. There is a lot of static from your background. Can you please adjust your mobile? Sure, I'll try again. Uh, hopefully, I'm audible now. Yes, I wanted you are. To understand, please go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to understand how is it that uh, you guys are reacting to the changes which uh, RBI has come up with uh, for MFI guidelines, uh, both with respect to the yields and also uh, on-ground processes, practices, and underwriting uh, norms as well. Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. Uh, so first of all, of course, the uh, you know the yields have gone up as far as we are concerned. So uh, our yields right now are between 24 to 24, uh, 24 to 26 percent, depending on different geographies uh, we are ch uh, charging to the customer. Over and above that, uh, the ticket sizes have gone up slightly as well. Uh, and thirdly, we have began uh, some level of income verification from our customers, at least to the household verifications are concerned. So a lot of it is work in progress, both from a, a credit bureau side and our own internal working side, wherein, you know, as far as credit bureau data is concerned, we have to capture the entire family's credit bureau data. So right now, uh, there are auto algorithms which are pulling the uh, member and the spouse's data as far as credit bureau is concerned. But anybody else, our system is not consolidating it. Uh, what's going to wind up happening is okay, in the next one or two quarters, there is going to be a holistic credit bureau report generated for the entire family. Uh, but a lot of complications. I don't want to get into it. It will take the entire... Uh, basically session uh, to talk about it but uh, but yeah there are definitely challenges in evaluating the entire household's indebtedness uh, both in terms of microfinance and any other loans that may have uh, and both in terms of the income and when you talk about the income of the rural segment uh, by far and large a lot of these guys are involved in multiple activities and their earnings are also uh, variable throughout the year, right? So whether, you know, there are always questions that come up, whether you want to count it at the low end, which makes more sense, or do you want to average it, or God forbid, count it on the higher end as far as the monthly incomes are concerned. So these are all, these all remain very uh, unanswered questions. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, when the RBI talks about a 3 lakh rupees household income as the limit for a micro loan, uh, that pretty much broadens the market quite a bit for us. If you consider that, you know, the vast majority of Indian households will make less than 25,000 rupees a month. So, uh, so it, it's quite inclusive of what is considered as a micro loan. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, margins have definitely increased, uh, you know, and we are evaluating the customer both on a household income level and on the household indebtedness level. Thanks. Uh, also, just a follow up, right? Because you mentioned margins have gone up uh, and hence you are able to, let's say, potentially recycle equity better, uh, right? Uh, so to that extent, within the MFI uh, book itself, right? So to that extent, how do you look at capital allocation between the three products? Uh, you know, the two either the MSME is also a high yielding product, but now uh, MFI also you are able to squeeze that extra bit of margins, right? So both from a capital allocation point of view between these three and the overall capital that you have 
the leverage that you are at this point what is the sort of runway that you're looking at uh, with uh, uh, you know those sort of capital levels yeah so so as far as the you know the product mix itself is concerned uh, see two wheelers has become sort of negligible so let's put that on the side for now a uh, lot of the lines which were drawn between what i had called msme versus microfinance have today now started to blend you know so when you talk about msme versus microfinance pre regulations you were talking about on one hand a glg based product with very minimal underwriting and on the other hand the msme product was you know doing an income evaluation on a household level and using foir to give a loan so all of a sudden that includes microfinance as well so the lines have sort of merged to an extent uh and so what's going to wind up happening in the msme side is that uh, the the evaluation will increase and the ticket sizes will have to probably increase as well uh now as far as the product mix is concerned as i said i'm i'm very keen to do more as i said in the past i'm very keen to do more msme and we have been growing that book uh well at least in the last one year i think uh, from a percentage standpoint the disbursements have increased and the aum has also increased uh, uh i think that aum increased by about 32% 30 35% percent over the last year so uh, but microfinance today is still the dominant dominant uh, you know dominant segment for for the company that will probably likely change in the next 3 to 5 years uh, but uh, today microfinance will still remain at about 80% of the book anything further Hello. Yeah. Thank so, you. So, yeah. so I just had one follow-up. Uh, if I can very quickly squeeze that in, just trying to understand from an overall uh, leverage pers- uh, perspective as well, right? So, on balance sheet we are at 4.6 or so. Uh, if we add the managed as well, uh, we go over five, right? So, uh, f- to that extent, how is it that you're looking at uh, leverage at a console basis and possibly, you know, the equity as well? Uh, uh, you know, uh, what sort of runway are we looking at, right, at this point? PR ratio is uh, approximately at about 24 odd percent on a console basis. On a console basis, kind of. normally you don't need to look at the console basis because uh, these are two different entities. So right. in Arman, uh, standalone it's about 29 percent, and in number of weeks I didn't maintain, uh, you know, something closer to 20 percent. But hypothetically, if we were to look at the console, then it was about 24 percent. right and uh, so wholly owned subsidiary so uh, basically whenever the subsidiary needs more capital historically it has asked for it from the parent uh now from a leveraging perspective i think your question is that uh you know how far can our equity push us uh, so right now as we did said we are at about 24 car uh we have taken steps in the past quarter to reduce that or increase the cr uh, percentage even further uh by you know putting some of the off book kind of uh, transaction which is the da transactions and we are of course looking for equity as well uh so uh, but, but for now we are comfortable Yeah. Uh, hi, Alok. Hi, Vivek. Uh, so, my first, uh, uh, like, you know, question is uh, pertaining to what other large industry players are saying that post this new guidelines, April may have been very slow. Uh, so, I just wanted to understand if you guys have also seen a similar trend in terms of April and May disbursement. No, in fact, it's been the opposite for us. Uh, the disbursements are. 
quite high. It seems that the demand is quite high as well. Uh, so yes, operationally it has been challenging, but uh, luckily we had a lot of practice with income evaluations and things through our MSME. So that helped us quite a bit of, you know, uh, from an inter segment kind of a way to take our learnings from the MSME segment and uh, put them into microfinance. So that, that I, I think that's probably what you are referring to. I don't particularly know which uh, peers that you are referring to, but a lot, lot of the peers were facing issues with income verification and, uh, uh, you know, yeah. evaluating indebtedness and stuff on a family level. Uh, so I think we have done, if I can put my own horn a little better uh, based, based on uh, the unique skill set that we had from the MSME division. Further, if I can add, I think in my, uh, even within microfinance, we also started something which is called the individual business loans, which were individual loans. Right. So that is still in a pilot phase, but uh, since it was uh, set into almost 70 branches at one go in pilot phase itself, though a very small book there, about 2% only, but still that kind of prepared us in income assessment in number itself at each of the branch level. So IDL was a product that we had started doing in microfinance uh, to graduate the customers into an individual loan with a cashless repayment methodology and a higher underwriting, you know, so, uh, so yeah, that's basically what Vivek was referring to. Got it. But your MSME would also be on similar lines, right? I'll be with a, a you know, slightly higher ticket size. Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, my, uh, uh, you know, other, other question was on this securitization that you've done. Uh, so now the gain is booked of 5.8 crores. Uh, is there any future credit loss uh, or any guarantee that uh, Arman had, uh, uh, Namra had to give or uh, uh, any collateral or FLDG? Well, uh, uh, by definition, a DA transaction cannot have any recourse. And is it correct? If I'm yeah, that's right. So there cannot be any guarantee or any uh, cash collateral or anything that's of that yeah. sort. Okay. Otherwise, it would not be considered as a direct assignment transaction. Understood. Uh, but they can anything to add there. So, ideally, what is happening is uh, as for the definition uh, under NDA, uh, a true sale where, is, where there is no recourse uh, on the percentage of the cash flows which are assigned, uh, you know, there, there cannot be any additional security in the nature of FLDG or uh, any enhancement structures. So, to that extent, uh, you know, there is no additional uh, provisioning requirement on those uh, assets. Uh, something similar to that are being done through PTC transactions, which remain on books only because, uh, you know, overall uh, the credit enhancement crosses about 10, 15 or 20 percent at times. So those are anyway on balance sheet and uh, are covered under the provisioning that is required for the entire asset class. Got it. And uh, after this, uh, you know, 100 crore securitization that is done in the fourth quarter, uh, are you looking at more such deals coming in in the coming financial year? Yeah, absolutely. We are, I mean, it's kind of a win-win situation uh, because uh, these are, uh, I mean, the rates are also quite competitive on DA transactions, number one. Uh, and number two, uh, it helps us with the CR ratio, as I mentioned earlier, because the asset is completely removed from our balance sheet. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, given that there is enough market interest, we are open of doing more such transactions in the future. Got it. And even without the securitization income, if I look at your cost to income, uh, it works out to be 40%. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, you're, obviously you are targeting some branch opening and all of that, but uh, the scale that you are, uh, can we expect this to further moderate down the cost to income ratios? I think for sure. Uh, now that we are charging higher interest rates and, uh, you know, the operating cost will not increase to a large extent, uh, 
I mean, it will take a few quarters probably because all the stuff that we have created in prior quarters was at a lower interest rate. So the weighted average interest rate will take some time to catch up to the current uh, whatever we are charging levels. Uh, but but yeah, uh, there is definitely a lot of scope for improvement with the new RBI regulations. Uh, got it, got it. Uh, got it. Uh, so, and uh, another was even without the DA transaction, uh, the other income was a bit higher this quarter. So, any any particular reason for that? So, you had about 9.2 crores, of which securitization was uh, 5.8 crores. So, remaining, what was the reason for the remaining other income? Was it that high liquidity that you were sitting on, of 160 so or so crores? Uh, yeah, you, you 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 kind of answered it for us. Um, Basically, it's been that the liquidity has been generally high, and that is about it. So, going forward, what liquidity uh, would you be comfortable at on the balance sheet? I mean, as much as possible, really, because we have pretty decent uh, growth targets. Ideally speaking, I would like at least one month's worth of disbursements worth of liquidity. Okay. Uh, not been always the case uh, for the past couple of months. Uh, you know, the first quarter is always light in terms of lenders. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's it's just nice to have the liquidity available. Uh, in, and there's been so many incidences in the last four or yeah. five years, uh, Demon and DHFL kind of crisis and COVID and stuff, where that extra liquidity has really helped us. So it does come at a cost of negative carry, but I think it's well worth it to have it. So, uh, so really want to work in a just-in-time kind of a system. Mm -hmm. The what has really helped us in the past is having large CC limits, but as the we are in a sort of a minority where NBFCs are concerned, most NBFCs did not have very large CC limits. Uh, most of the funding was done through term loan kind of structures. Uh, but now the debt portfolio increases more and more. The CC limits become less and less meaningful from a percentage basis for us also. Okay. Uh, negative carry will continue to impact us from a PNL standpoint uh, in the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, lastly, on the two-wheeler side, uh, like you know, though uh, like you know, it has become like below four percent of your AUM, and it's as good as meaningless at this point of time. Uh, but uh, you were at a hundred crore plus AUM uh, at, in this two-wheeler book. So I just wanted to get your long-term thoughts on this. Uh, like you know, are we looking at scaling this up to a two hundred, three hundred crore AUM at some point of time? Uh, so right now, it's uh, you know the market conditions are such that it's kind of on ice uh, at the moment. As the conditions improve, we'll make a call uh, whether we want to kind of re-enter this segment uh, uh, you know, on a substantial level or not. Uh, we are doing rural two-wheelers, which is, which is generating pretty good uh, yeah. And that is essentially a tag-on product for our MSME book. So, uh, it doesn't require a whole another operation to do it. It's being done through our, a lot of it is being done through our MSME branches itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm a little bullish on the EV uh, side. I mean, it's a little too early to start it, but uh, definitely something to consider down the road. Uh, and, and let's see. I think two-wheeler has been our bread and butter for a long, long time through very rough uh, or um, when we were much, much smaller than we are today. So also there is a bit of a sentimental value, attachment to it as well. But uh, of course, sentiments have no place in uh, running a business. But still, you know, it's we don't want to completely shutter the doors. We want to keep some door open where we can get into it in the future. Got it, got it. I have some more questions, but I'll come back in the queue. Uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Yash Mehta from Steenberg Asset Management. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, on on your MSME business, uh, we had seen obviously a couple of quarters ago there were elevated slippages. 
that is obviously normalized to the current levels which are let's say around 8% or so of the npa uh, how how do you see let's say uh, the traction on this business and any guidance that you would like to give on the scale up here Scale up on which, which segment are we talking of? What are MSN. we talking about? MSN. MSN side. No, I mean we are trying to scale up. It's a you know it takes kind of a unique customer, so it's not as sim simple. I don't want to say microfinance is simpler, but you know it takes a specific kind of a customer in a specific occupation to do a MSME kind of a loan. of course the margins that we enjoy in msme are far superior as well so there are no complaints there but uh, but yeah i mean uh, it it's very difficult to grow the msme book at microfinance levels of 50 60% a year you know uh, still we are managing to grow at about 35 to 40% on a year on year basis and i think you should see that continuing uh, for the for the years to come And, and so let's say obviously uh, on our current base of the of the MFI business that we have, what share of customers would you say actually qualify for some of these MSME loans? Like where they must have had some credit history with you, and you would like to kind of upgrade them to becoming these MSME customers, right? No, I mean these are not upgraded customers. Uh, these are completely a different segment. So. we don't approach msme like a lot of our peers do that you know you uh, been with us for 4 5 years and uh, here's a higher ticket size loan and enjoy so it's not like that i mean we are trying to target customers who are uh, one step above uh, the microfinance customers right so these could be male customers for example you know uh, microfinance is purely cap concentrating on jlg female customers it could be male customers and their businesses would be at sort of a higher level than a simple like a household uh, income generating activity right like a tailoring machine or or a or a uh, buying one cattle or something to sell milk so it would be at a higher level and uh, so we are not relying on uh, our microfinance customers to Um, uh, to do our uh, MSME book. And so, can you give some broad uh, use cases for which you've been giving MSME, like in terms of let's say the your buy of the mix? Say that again. I'm saying that let's say this is obviously not for just buying cattle. I'm saying in terms of the broad use case for the MSME book, uh, the nature of the Kirana Walas. It could be. scrap dealers it could be people uh, involved I mean, in the spice trade it could be people who supply textilers do embroidery job work uh, and even if they are dairy dairy then they are the larger 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 number of cattle larger cattle in the dairy side so so primarily i think uh, you know uh, one thing is that the msme in arman are completely different branches and segregated areas and they do not kind of generally overlap with the numerous uh, geographies except for few uh, branches here and there but generally these are absolutely different geographies and these are absolutely different dedicated branches for msme and microfinance understood and my last question is let's say we've seen our yields now obviously currently at 22% they are going to 24 26% in that range incrementally uh then the question is would you like to go would you go deeper in terms of let's say a customer that you've not approached before because now your ability to price that customer also is much better like you I mean, may have gone kind of left out a particular customer segment earlier at a certain yeah. yield level yes correct yes so geographies we are definitely evaluate so let's put it that way so not on an individual customer level but there were certain geographies that were more riskier than others or certain geographies that came at a higher operating cost than others so we would be looking at those for sure all right that's all from my side thank you very much thank you 
you may press star and one on your touch tone phone to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Amit Mantri from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Alok. Sorry, I got disconnected earlier. So just again on the same question, uh, just a bit more understanding. So as of now, in the new regime, so you had mentioned that one, you're doing region-specific uh, pricing of interest rates. Uh, is that the only criteria right now, or are there other factors also that determine the inter interest rates, be it, say, which cycle the borrower is, uh, or anything else? Yes, so there are numerous ways to divide it up. One is by ticket size, one is by geographies. Uh, the plan is to add a level of sophistication on the interest side. Of course, stuff like competition would also play a factor uh, into the equation. Uh, but right now, we are just doing it on geography because, you know, there's a lot to concentrate on as far as... I mean, uh, look, if I can add, yeah, uh, geography plus ticket size. Now, ticket size is, uh, I mean, a function of cycle also. Yeah. So, uh, hmm. you know, uh, as you give larger ticket sizes, you are basically going to uh, the same customer who's in the third or fourth cycle upwards. Correct. Mm -hmm. But with ticket size, yeah, but ticket, increases come a higher risk. Higher risk. So, um, you know, to that extent, it might sound counterintuitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as we've kind of always said, uh, generally speaking, the unsecured loan borrower is interest rate agnostic, which doesn't mean that we kind of uh, charge them anything uh, that way. But generally... Uh, if, if a customer in the third or fourth cycle was limited to 40,000 and now we are kind of increasing it to 50 and 60. So the timely delivery of credit and, uh, you know, the higher uh, ticket size, uh, there is a there's a room for, uh, you know, a better margin there. Sure, understood. So... There so that explains the ticket size increase, basically, that, you know, yeah. that means you, there is terms of criteria that they can use, uh, you know, well, one is, uh, of course, uh, ethics that you shouldn't really take advantage of a situation. And so the board has uh, set a hard limit on what that you cannot cross a certain interest rates. But other than that, there is, you know, demand and affordability and competition and, uh, you know, operating costs and risk premiums, tenure also you can do, or size, loan cycle as the age of the branch, you know, that as the number of customers increases, your operating cost in a branch decreases, so you can price it according to that. There is also estimated credit cost and what profit margins and what peers are charging. So there are numerous possibilities for pricing. A uh, lot of it that evaluate as time goes on. Sure, sure, understood. And on this, uh, so currently there are 65 crores of provisions on the book. So can you give a breakup of that? How much of it is, uh, say, standard uh, provisioning and how much of it is NP related and how much, if there is anything else apart from that, of the 65 crores? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, just to give a breakup between Arman and Namra, it's about 47 for the microfinance book. And the balance 18 is uh, on uh, the Arman book for the two-wheeler and MSME book. In terms of, uh, uh, you know... I think 18 crores is on standard assets. Uh, NP is about 30 crores. So, uh, you know, typically... Books. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just give me a second. Uh, so... The overall uh, NPA, as far as uh, the number of book is concerned, is approximately uh, we have provisions of 28 crores there for the NPA specific provision. And uh, as far as Arman is uh, concerned, we just add 21 crores uh, total, and uh, I think it's half and half of it. So about 12, uh, about 13 crores there as NPA provisions. So overall, uh, about for, you know about 48 crores out of that 65 crores the NPA provisions. 48 is uh, NPA provision. The rest 17 would be standard asset, is it? Yes, yeah, standard asset. Correct. Hello. 
Yeah, yeah, that would be correct. Did we lose him again or are we lost? Yes. Uh, okay, let's move on. Moving on to the next question. The next question is from the line of Savi from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I think uh, again Amit uh, uh, was lost, but on this, um, the standard provisioning has not been netted off, right? If you net that off, the net NPA will go to zero, right? No, no, uh, the standard NPA provision and say the gross NPA uh, is the gross NPA for, uh, let's say, just help, uh, speak for, for a minute about. Uh, uh, for Namra. Namra, uh, the microfinance, the gross NPA is 34 crores, 34.5 crores. Against that 34 crores, there is a 28 crore uh, NPA provision. So the net NPA will turn out to be uh, 34 minus 28, uh, which is about, let's say, 7, cro uh, 7 crores, right? So that is the net NPA there. And similarly for Arman, uh, the, the uh, gross NPAs on Arman uh, that we would have, uh, let's say, uh, to give you a segment-wise breakdown, the gross NPA numbers for two-wheeler is 3.17 crores, against which we have a provision of 2.23 crores of uh, specific NPA provision. So my net NPA is just uh, 0.94 crores in two-wheeler segment. In MSME, our gross NPA is 12.89, against which we have a provision of 10.67 crores, giving a net NPA of 2.2 crores. So in Arman, the net NPA is about you know 3.15 crores, which means about 1.79 percent. And in Arma uh, and in Namra microfinance side, uh, it will turn out to be you know, whatever, uh, something like uh, less than less than a percent, point six percent. Yeah, but again, these, if you also knock up the standard provisioning, then... No, okay, so what you're saying is in terms of the provision coverage, just the provision coverage... Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's one way of looking at it. So if you look at it that way, probably the overall provision for microfinance book would be much bigger. It will be maybe about 130%. And Arman will turn out to be almost 100, whatever, 50%. But again, more specifically, I think... We have 100% provision on IP interest also. I guess. Yeah. So that's... Got it. Yet ECL has really, I mean, the, <coughs> the ECL has really kind of confused matters on what is standard and what is not. Because there is the RBI method of calculating there is the ECL method of calculating and you have to kind of take whatever is higher, mm -hmm. which in our case is always the ECL. So uh, I, I know where you are coming from, from the, the stand. Typically speaking, pre-NDS, we reported standard assets separate and then NPA provisioning separate. <coughs> now it is just kind of one big blended number, you know. So anyway, uh, uh, I think uh, what yeah, we so have to Next year. Uh, again, uh, Savi, uh, just to uh, further clarify, what happens is uh, generally we have seen this practice which uh, uh, PA ratio. Now, typically when you are doing an expected uh, loss calculation, then I think generally speaking it's a good, good ratio to just show, but it probably does not really mean too much because I require provisions against standard assets as well and against the uh, uh, NP assets, there has to be a specific provision. So I think the specific coverage is rather more important. So my NP gross assets have a coverage of, uh, you know, roughly 80 plus percent. So that's that's to our understanding a more important uh, thing to be prepared for because if my NPA assets are let's say 50 crores and against that 50 crores my NPA specific provisions on these specific assets 
itself is 40 plus crores, which is almost like 81, 82 mm. percent. Rather more uh, definitive way of gauging losses, rather than saying that against the 50 crores of NPA, I have a provision cover of 65 crores with 130 percent. Yeah, no, got it. So this quarter, what was the reason for increasing provisions? Was it to increase the coverage ratio uh, on the NPA, or I mean, uh, collections were pretty good, right? So what was the reason? Uh, I mean, QOQ also there's not been a decline. It's, it's all the past stuff, now first wave, second wave, all of that stuff, which is finally kind of uh, you just have to clean up. So. Uh, I mean, something which is like pre-COVID and still not an NPA bucket, but mm. uh, is is in, uh, say, 30 to 60 day bucket or what we call as a stage two assets, uh, will continue to have a higher coverage uh, provisioning requirement uh, because uh, what is also happening, honestly, is that uh, a lot of these are moratorium interest disputes as well. So a uh, lot of the microfinance customers, when they took the original moratorium or we gave it to them, uh, there was an interest that was accrued during the moratorium period. Uh, however, uh, you know, that uh, uh, now it's disputed. A lot of customers don't understand moratorium interest. I think most people didn't before this whole COVID crisis came. Uh, so they say that we have paid as per the regular schedule and what is this extra money that you are asking us. So a lot of that was clean up exercise as well where there would be a couple of thousand rupees pending per customer and that was disputed and you know the cost of recovering that small amount was far exceeding uh, anything mm. the cost would exceed any recovery effort that we would make. So the option was to just essentially write it off or, or, provide, for or provide for it. So this year in FY23, will we have a normalized credit cost which is equal near to the pre-COVID levels? Yeah, I, I don't think it's ever really going to go back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, this is my uh, okay. humble pessimistic opinion. Uh, the days of 1% credit cost in microfinance are behind us. They were behind us even before COVID. Uh, now, with, I think uh, the loan losses, you'll have to expect it a slightly higher number. Uh, I don't want to give you any number, you know. I mean, I'm not going to say it's going to be 5% or anything ridiculously large like that. But definitely, it's going to be higher than 1%, maybe slightly less than 2% even on an ongoing basis. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's the way it is. But thankfully, with the new RBI regulations, I can pass that on, right? So it's not going to impact me too much. But uh, so anything, you know, specific to the COVID waves, all of that has been cleaned up in this quarter. Now, nothing, nothing extra is left there, right? By far and large, By it, has far large. It, is, uh, it has been cleaned up plus provided for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I meant that only. Uh, yeah, so the reason why I say by far and large is that we won't know completely until uh, August of this year because you'll still get into those interest disputes and things like that uh, towards the end of the loans. Uh, so uh, by far and large, it's behind us. Uh, and on the outlook for growth, can you give a number for FI23? Unfortunately, we are not giving it, but it, we are expecting a pretty good year. Uh, yeah. You know, we are, we are used to growing at 40-50%, so at least that much. But that would lead to significant increase in leverage unless you do direct assignment transactions. So what is your thought on that? Are you comfortable with even higher leverage from here on? Um, and so we are evaluating different options. Uh, one, of obviously, is raising more capital. Second, doing more DA transactions. Uh, mm. Third is tier two, okay. tier two kind of structures as well. So mm. we are, but if we can raise further equity, nothing like it, you know. Um, so it may also affect your credit rating, right? If you continue to increase your leverage. Uh, so we'll never go beyond like 18% CAR or anything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Let's.
And, and, and uh, last question is on your diversification. So there has been some significant progress there, and now MP is almost equal to Gujarat, and UP is even larger than Gujarat. So uh, I mean, uh, it looks like a conscious decision for you to diversify across states. But what is the implication uh, in terms of you know cost to income and asset quality, and what is the experience in the newer states? Uh, in terms of asset quality, uh, uh, how are you looking at that? Uh, say that one more time. So geographically, yes, uh, it's a uh, it's a conscious decision to kind of uh, de-risk ourselves in our existing geographies of, let's say, uh, Gujarat and MP that we had been historically present, and slowly but surely we've moved into new geographies, including UP and. Haryana, Rajasthan, and so on and so forth. Uh, UP definitely is a large state, uh, and uh, you know we've seen uh, over the last five years that we've been there. Generally, a good. Uh, UP has performed. I mean, Touchwood has performed extremely well during COVID. Probably, uh, if you discount discount the newer states that we opened, it's probably been the best performing state. Uh, the worst has been Maharashtra, uh, so the plan is to not open for branches there at least for the time being. Uh, and Madhya Pradesh after that, uh, with specific uh, districts, specific districts, Jabalpur and areas like that. Uh, but rest of the other states have performed well. You know, I would say that between Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra, that should be over two thirds of our uh, credit yeah. cost. So, so largely, what we're trying to do is what we've been always saying, to, at least to a situation that where each of these states kind of represents uh, less than 25 percent, and then slowly represent less than 20 percent. Mm. And in terms of hiring, you know, you've been hiring a lot of people at the junior level, but. Are you also looking to hire people at a senior level now that you become a large? Yeah, I mean, we can get junior, senior, and middle level all, all, all the way. So I think we just hired a chief risk officer as well. Uh, so he comes with good 30, 40 years of experience in the banking sector, banking and NBFC both. So uh, we hired a good IT person as well. So at a higher level on the software side, hardware we already had. So at all layers we are hiring. You got it. Yeah, that's, thank you. That's it. That's it from us. I think we'll have to uh, uh, call it. Uh, I have a, some obligation. Which I, so I think uh, Michelle probably maybe one last question. If there is anybody else or. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that as the last question. On behalf of MK Global Financial Services, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you. Thank you.